Welcome to Super Nutrition Academy's health class with your host and registered holistic nutritionist, Uriel Kame. Tune in each week for up-to-date insights on breaking health news and best practices on how to eat for awesome health. It's time to get smarter, healthier, and regain your sanity in a world of information overload. And don't forget to join Yuri at supernutritionacademy.com so you too can master your nutrition and health. Welcome to episode nine of the Super Nutrition Academy Health Class. Uriel came back with you for another great episode. Today we're going to be talking about new health trends. This is some interesting information because once you understand this, you're going to start to understand why a lot of the products are on the markets uh, today and why they, um, I guess, uh, assume certain things about people and why they can mislead consumers into consuming them uh, a little bit more than they should. So I'm not too sure if that makes any sense. But essentially what we'll be looking at is, um, excuse me, we'll be looking at nine health trends. So this is actually research from uh, Canada. This was uh, published a couple of years ago. This is 2000, this is coming out of uh, October 2011 from the Agri-Food Trade Service in Canada. And the title is uh, The Health and Wellness Trends for Canada and the World. So this is about two years old, but these trends are still very much relevant to this point in time, you know, early 2013. So let's, uh, let's first off start by understanding how a trend develops. So basically, from my perspective, within the health kind of realm, what ends up happening is that somehow people get educated. They get informed about a specific topic. Uh, it could be, you know, a, a study that was released and the media picked it up and then it was blown out of proportion. Uh, maybe sometimes it was misconstrued, but nonetheless, it becomes very popular. So, it, you know, it becomes a trending topic in discussion. As a result of that, there's more demand for that specific trend. And then as a result of that, food companies catch on to that demand and then they create consumer goods, which can in some cases be deceiving. So let's look at the example of organic foods. Okay, so organic foods probably came really heavily onto market maybe about 20 years ago. And it's actually funny that the way food is naturally supposed to be raised is now called organic and we now pay more money for it which is kind of ironic. So anyways, um, organic foods, I guess people became more and more health conscious or became more aware of the realities of our food supply, maybe about 20 years ago, I guess. And as a result of that, there's been more and more demand for healthier grown organic foods. So as a result of that, because of this education from wherever it came from, be it schools, media, wherever, uh, more and more people demanded these kind of foods. Then you have stores like Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, all sorts of online markets that are starting to pop up that are delivering those organic goods to consumers. Now, this is where you know companies can become very clever is that they can start packaging foods that are traditionally seen as packaged foods like frozen pizza, and they can call it organic frozen pizza as long as it meets a certain criteria for the organic certification. So even though cookies or pizza or ice cream you know, is organic, does that necessarily mean that it's still good for you? And in a lot of cases, the answer is no. But that's why understanding how these trends develop and what these trends are can help you make better decisions with respect to your foods. So let's go over nine trends that were disclosed in this report by the um, uh, Agri-Foods Trade in Canada in 2011. And then we'll look at, you know, what this means to you. Okay, so first of all, we're going to look at a group of foods called the better for you foods. And these are like, they're really the simple way to understand these are pretty much foods that say low fat, low salt, low sugar, anything that's kind of any kind of a, a, a whole food that has been reduced in some way. So the whole idea here is that the understanding is that people have become more health conscious, therefore they understand that fats are not good for them, sugars are not good for them, salt is not good for them, carbohydrates supposedly are not good for them. So now we have a lot of products on the market where it's low fat, low sugar, low salt, carb free, high protein. And the the unfortunate part is that a lot of this information is is false, is based on false or heavily 
uh, blown out of proportion science, right? So the whole idea that fats are bad for us is really based on some faulty science back in the 1970s, which led, I mean, a whole cascade of events to us believing and even researchers to believing that fats were the cause of heart disease and, and, and obesity, right? Sugars, we know we know they're, they're not good for us. Obviously, there's a sugar association cover-up, which we just uncovered in the last episode, which is trying to cover a lot of that stuff up. But we know that, you know, anything with, with a lot of sugar is not necessarily good for us. But the thing is, you know, when we're, when we're looking at products, whether they be cereals or drinks or whatever else that are low sugar, remember that they're replacing that sugar with something else. And a lot of times it's aspartame or not, another artificial sweetener, which is really not good for you. So um, that's the first big health uh, trend uh, as of the late 2011 is this, this increased desire for better for you foods. Um Again, consumers are paying closer attention to the labels of products and they want to make sure that what they're purchasing is the healthiest product available. However, again, this is very important to understand. I, I Personally, I see these as fractionized foods. So, right, so you take a whole food, well, seemingly a whole food, and then you remove something out of it. So you take away some fat, you take away some sugar. Uh, so therefore, now we, we have we don't really have a whole food, and, and not necessarily that it was a whole food in the first place if it's ending up in a package or a box. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it's I, I, I see them as fractionized foods where they're not complete. They're they're taking actually the the best example of this, the one that really frustrates me is yogurt. It's very tough, at least in Canada where I live, to purchase whole fat organic yogurt. Really, again, and this this comes, I believe this comes back to miseducation, misinformation, and hopefully this will change over time. And I think I mentioned this about going to Starbucks and not being able to find a full fat yogurt, uh, organic yogurt. It's all zero fats, you know, low sugar, and that's because they believe that's what people want. And it is. People want that stuff. But again, it's because they've been misinformed about this stuff. So, a full fat yogurt is actually a lot better for you than a low fat, low sugar yogurt, just because those low sugar, low fat things are just pumped full of Splenda and other artificial forms of, of, of ingredients. So until the point where the, the, the kind of the critical mass of consumers says, hey, you know what? I actually want a full fat yogurt, not a 0% yogurt. Until that happens, we're not going to see much of a change. And that's why this kind of information needs to get out there because more and more people need to understand that fat, again, yogurt, you know, seemingly is probably the closest we can get to a whole food in a packaged product, right, outside of produce. It's the closest thing we can get. So as soon as we start taking away fat, we start chemically altering it. Now it's a fractionized food. It doesn't have the same benefit inside of us. We start pumping it with all sorts of weird bacteria and stuff. It's no longer the same. But again, right now, people believe that they need a low-fat yogurt because they believe that low-fat is the way to go. Low-fat means less fat in your body. That's not necessarily true, okay? So until we get to the point, uh, this critical mass where we all understand or more of us understand that fat is not the problem, the types of fats are the problem, and a lot of times the whole food, in most cases like yogurt, is much better than a fractionized form of it, uh, we're going to continue to see these products because this better for you market is a huge trend. Um, in 2010, this market alone accounted for $160 billion globally. Um, and it's grown from 4.4% to 6.1% over the to- over the over the e- previous 12 months, according to this report coming out of Canada. So we're seeing more and more consumers looking for this stuff. Again, it's based on I believe a lot of misinformation out there. So there we go. That's the first trend. The second trend we're seeing a lot of, obviously, as we just alluded to, is organic foods. So organic foods is pretty big, but it's actually still really minuscule in comparison to the better for you foods it's the global market uh, as of 2011 for um actually sorry it's uh it's not not smaller it's it's a little bit bigger uh sorry i i missed uh 
no, actually, um, you know what? I'm sorry. I keep mistakenly, I'm, I'm mistaking B's for M's. So let me just repeat myself. The better for you food market is $160 billion global business. The organic food bar, uh, food market, food market is still in the billions but smaller it's only 27 billion dollars globally which is quite a bit smaller than the whole low fat low sugar thing so nonetheless still big business right and we're seeing an increase uh they're they're looking to increase that well they're predicting that's going to be increased by about 33 percent by 2015 so that's pretty it's a pretty big jump so anyways um again as we alluded to we're seeing more and more local farmers growing organic produce. Unfortunately, the certification process to get organically certified or certified organic, whether it be in Canada or the States, can be expensive for a lot of farmers. Therefore, a lot of local farmers markets, for instance, don't necessarily have vendors that are selling quote unquote certified organic but they're still selling produce that is grown conventional uh conventionally without pesticides and herbicides they just haven't gone through the certification process so that's something else to consider is that especially in local farmers markets uh, you can get really good produce and really good quality food that's not certified organic just because they didn't want to go through that laborious uh, expensive certification process you know we've got local farmers uh, close to our place where we buy produce from in the spring and summer that is amazing but they're not certified organic but we know that they don't spray with pesticides and all that other stuff so for us it's good enough um, about 12 percent of canadian consumers say that they purchase organic food for themselves 20 percent of consumers are saying that they purchase organic food for their kids so we'll probably see very similar numbers in the u.s and probably most westernized countries and we're starting to see a bigger growth in the organic industry with respect to dairy products. I think more and more people are becoming uh, aware of the use of antibiotics and hormones in various areas uh, of the Western world with respect to dairy. So more and more people are becoming conscious of that. And so they've seen, a, based on this report, about a 15% growth in organic dairy products within a 12-month period between 2010 and 2011, which is, you know, which is pretty good. So at least, you know, with that, we're starting to see some really good, some good movement. So needless to say, we are seeing more and more um, organic stuff. Now, we're also seeing more and more organic stuff within the packaged food industry. So we're seeing baked goods, uh, packaged foods, ready-made meals, baby foods. All of that stuff is, is still increasing in popularity. And now more and more, um, more and more than ever, just because it has the organic label on it. But again, you know, chips that are organic, does that mean they're healthy? No, right? You can still have organic corn oil, but that doesn't mean that it's good for you. So anyways, um, all right, so let's move on to the next trend. This is actually a really interesting one. This is the fortified or functional food trend. So fortified or functional foods are pretty much what they what the name implies. So if you have like, I guess this is very commonly seen in breads and juices. Uh, two that come to mind are Wonder Bread, which is you know white bread, which has no nutritional value and has no business being in our supermarkets. But it's a fortified food now because they've added in DHA. And now they advertise it on TV as being a brain-healthy food because, again, this is where you really need to be an intelligent consumer is we understand that omega-3s are bro or we should understand. We'll probably talk about this in more detail at uh, a later time. Omega-3s are broken down into EPA and DHA, which are the two kind of active uh, forms of those fatty acids and DHA specifically is very very healthful for your brain and the brain of your children specifically so these clever companies uh, jump onto the bandwagon and they inject white bread with DHA and then they want us to believe that it's actually good for our kids brains now unless you're a a smart consumer and you know this information then you're probably going to go pick up white bread because it has DHA in it and unfortunately, there are tens of millions of people and uh, people and families who are in that category of, of not knowing better. So again, it's very misleading. Also, you have uh, things like Tropicana orange juice, which are, uh, which are, again, orange juice, which has been pasteurized. So it really has no nutritional value necessarily anymore because it's been heat treated. And again, they're injecting it with omega-3 fats. 
or, or, or vitamin D or whatever it might be. Okay. So, you know, we're, it's, it's, we're taking a food and we're injecting with some other kind of mineral vitamin nutrients that the general public deems as healthful. And these companies jump on the bad wagon and say, Hey, you know what? Well, let's throw this in because we know it's good for you. And this has nothing to do with this specific food, but now it's a fortified food, which means that it's good for you. Um, you know, we're also seeing this with like, for instance, V8 vegetable juice. So they've introduced V8 V fusion, which is like, uh, fruit and vegetable juices that have different flavors, like pomegranate, blueberry, acai, mixed berry. Cause again, this whole, this whole trend of acai berries over the last couple of years, you know, it's got people thinking, okay, well, acai berry is really good for us. It's got antioxidants, blah, blah, blah. But again, you know, in its, in its form coming from these big food conglomerates, there's really no nutritional value to any of this stuff anyways. So yeah. So that's the fortified and functional food category. Next up, we have naturally healthy foods. So what, what, is, what is a naturally healthy food? Well, according to this, uh, this report, naturally healthy foods tend to be minimally processed and generally include ingredients that naturally contain vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients, which are essential to a healthy diet. A number of these are made using no hormones and antibiotics and also contain a lower percentage of fat, sugar, and sodium. So let me see if I can get you uh, some examples here. So within, for instance, the beverage category, right, the most popular would be 100% fruit or vegetable juice, uh, natural mineral water and spring water. And sales within this category are projected to be about $185 billion by 2015. So that's a huge, huge market. And I'm going to devote actually the next episode to this concept of juicing and pre-bottled juices in supermarkets. Uh, I'll, so I'll save that for the next episode and there's actually some really interesting stuff i've come across which i want to share with you too so be sure to stay tuned for that one um we're also seeing for instance soy okay so this the soy industry is huge uh it's continued to exponentially grow over the last decade uh it's now more than a six billion dollar industry and uh, let's see if I can give you some examples. Again, soy is it's included in everything. Okay, so again, this comes back down to misinformation. We now know, or most, I mean, hopefully, more and more people are starting to realize that first of all, the thing with soy is that for the most part, most of the soy that we have access to in our food supply is heavily genetically modified. So first of all, you're not going to find much science that's going to say there's problems with genetically modified foods uh, for human health. Unfortunately, obviously, we know that a lot of the science is heavily biased, but when you take a food and you chemically alter it, you genetically alter it, obviously, it's going to alter its reaction inside the body. So there is some research showing that genetically modified corn, for instance, has severe long-term repercussions on the intestinal health or the, gut, um, the health of your gut, so the intestinal lining, and that could potentially lead to leaky gut and all sorts of other autoimmune or allergy related stuff as a result of that. So soy, first of all, is heavily genetically modified. It's also in the most, in a lot of cases, not organic that's being kind of injected into these. It's, it's, it's a very common ingredient in a lot of foods. As a result of its ubiquity, it being used all over the place, it has now become one of the most common allergenic foods in our food supply. And obviously that's problematic. The other thing is that it, it's a a goitrogenic food, which means that it suppresses a thyroid function. So, you know, now and nowadays, I mean, we're seeing more and more women develop, or actually, you know, men as well, hypothyroidism, underactive thyroid. And part of that could be due to, obviously, there's other, there's other factors, but an overabundance uh, of soy products in their diet. Um, high fiber products is another category within this naturally healthy foods. Uh, so things like, I'm just kind of thinking off the top of my head, um, like um, all brand, so all brand cereal as an example. Um, you know, anywhere where they're, you know, again, these, these products are trying to have you believe that because they're higher in fiber or higher in whatever, uh, they are good for you, right? Again, for, for me, honestly, the, the, the very simple rule of thumb is that is if it's advertised on TV or in magazines for the most part, so especially on TV, if it's, if it's let's just stick with TV. If it's advertised on TV, you should probably avoid it. That's, that's pretty much the way I see it because most of the stuff that's on TV, you're not going to see advertisements for broccoli. 
You're going to see ads for French fries. You're going to see ads for, for you know, heavily pesticided foods or, or chemically altered foods, packaged foods, because that's where the money is. So that's that's my two cents about that. So that's the next trend is that the this this naturally uh, naturally healthy food trends, which you know is a good thing to some degree because more and more people are looking for things that are not pesticide and you know not chemically induced. But nonetheless, there are some issues with that. Uh, another huge trend, and this is I think this is actually a good thing, is the intolerance foods market. So which means that we're seeing more and more people with gluten sensitivities issues with uh, with different products like specifically actually the gluten-free market is pretty huge um, to give you an example the canadian food intolerance market is globally ranked as 10th in the world with a value of 161 bill, uh, 61 million so it's not obviously as big as the organic or the better for you foods by a long shot but it's getting there it's it's growing pretty rapidly and we're seeing this online now with you know more and more people looking for gluten-free information gluten-free diets gluten-free recipes and that's a great thing because more and more individuals are starting to realize that they have intolerances to wheat so they can't digest it properly or they have sensitivities to gluten or they have a full-blown allergy so for instance they might have celiac disease in which case they can't they can, they can't even tolerate gluten at all. So food intolerance market is is growing uh, pretty rapidly. But again, don't let this fool you because you can find uh, sugary cereals out there or cookies or crackers that are gluten free but still contain high amounts of sugar, high amounts of sodium, sulfites. You know whatever. I mean, you name it. So just because something is gluten free doesn't necessarily mean that you should be grabbing, you know, you should be getting ready for a hurricane and storing up your bunker with this kind of stuff. Okay, so be smart about it. Look at the ingredient list. Is it, you know, relatively whole, you know, wholesome or is there some stuff that's questionable in there? Next up we have the halal and kosher diets or that whole trend. Uh, which is big. I mean, when you consider the amount of uh, of people who follow the Muslim tradition of of eating halal meats, or, or you know, part of the Islamic faith, or even with uh, with the Jewish uh, population with with kosher stuff, um, it's obviously you know people who are a little bit more adherent to those religions are are looking for types of foods that they can turn to in those cases. Now, having said that. Um, Speaking from experience, koshered foods are pretty expensive when you compare it to non-kosher foods. Not that I buy kosher foods, but um, half my family does. So, you know, they'll have, you know, kosher meats. They'll, you know, they'll buy that kind of stuff. And they'll be paying, you know, in some cases double what they would be paying for the normal, organic, healthy version. So just because it's been blessed by a rabbi, you know, now we're seeing a double in price. So <laughs> you may want to consider that as well. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's just look at some upcoming trends that have been forecasted within this report. We've got things like healthy snacking. So we're looking at, uh, obviously, people are on the go. They don't have time to eat anymore. So we're looking at very quick, quick to go snacks that are relatively healthy. So we're seeing increased uh, things like granola bars, hummus, falafel chips, uh, all sorts of healthy chips. Like, you know, there's no wheat. Uh, actually, one of my favorites, this is actually one of my indulgences that I don't eat too often because if I do, I'll eat an entire bag, is a company called Rice Works, And they come out with, it's like gluten-free, wheat-free, everything-free type of chip. And it's just, it's it's like a thousand times better than Doritos. So this is like my one weak point within the packaged food category are these Rice Works. I got hooked on them a long time ago. And I make sure that we don't bring them into the house. Although Amy just for whatever reason, bought a bag of them yesterday, and it's been months since I've had them. So <laughs> they're few and far between, uh, and they're delicious. But again, if you look at the ingredient list, you know, you've got safflower, sunflower, cottonseed oil, uh, soybean oil in there, or canola oil, sorry. So you've got three omega 6 rich oils in there. Not the greatest thing. Other than that, I mean, it's a red, I mean, other than the oils, which obviously are a huge issue, it's not that bad of a product. So healthy snacking is becoming more and more uh, in demand, right? Because I'm not going to go eat Doritos or, or, you know, Miss Vicky's potato chips. If I feel like a little craving like that, I'm going to go for Rice Works. So healthy snacking is becoming more and more popular. We're seeing the like granola bars, chips, cookies, all that stuff. Teas, 
Uh, apparently they're becoming big as well. So we're seeing more and more tea shops pop up. Uh, it's becoming kind of a, a really interesting fad or a trend where it's kind of, you know, all these different blends of teas and flavors and stuff is really cool. And actually tea has a lot of health properties. So this is actually one category where I think that there's some real merit because when you look at things like green tea, kombucha tea, uh, Wulong tea. There's a lot of really good health benefits from a metabolism standpoint, from the antioxidant standpoint of a lot of them. So that's a really, really good thing. And that's that's an encouraging food trend. And, and finally, we're seeing more and more Mediterranean foods pop up in the grocery stores. And a lot of the times they're coming up in uh, kind of their package ready to go format. So we're seeing things like hummus, tabu- um, uh, baba ganoush, you know, those are kind of a little bit more Middle Eastern we're looking at generally things that are, again, of the Mediterranean area just because we're, we now or people have become more aware of the fact that the Mediterranean diet is one of the healthiest diets around. And I don't know if they necessarily know why, but they generally tend to say, hey, you know, if this comes from Italy or from the Middle East, it's, you know, it's typically pretty good. So and obviously the taste is there as well. So that is becoming a, uh, a growing area are growing segments of local grocery stores in a lot of cases nowadays. So those are some of the biggest, those are nine of the biggest food trends that we are seeing over the last year or two, and they're going to continue to grow. Uh, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else that I can think of off the top of my head, which I haven't mentioned in this, which I'm kind of seeing. Again, we're seeing, um, again, I'll mention this in the next podcast with uh, this whole juice market. Uh, that's that's a huge trend, and I'm not too sure if it's, obviously, it's categorized in, in these kind of functional or fortified foods already. But I'm going to talk about that specifically in the next episode because I think it's really important to understand the reality of these pre-bottled juices. So we'll talk about that in the next episode. And I just want to skim over my notes here to make sure I haven't missed anything that I wanted to cover. Um, I don't think so. I think we've, we've, we've really had a nice kind of overview of these nine health trends. I guess the message I want to get across to you is that we're in a really good place now in terms of becoming a, as a whole more aware and health conscious, which is great. However, companies and food, the food industry is also caught on to this. And, and, and for the most part, unless you are an intelligent consumer who understands that, for instance, full fat yogurt is better than low fat yogurt, Millions of people are going to continue to be misled with this kind of information in terms of like the marketing of of low fat is better than full fat type of stuff. So we're moving in the right direction, but there still needs to be a better movement along the spectrum of of understanding what is healthy and what is not. So hopefully this podcast is is helping you do that to make better choices for yourself. And uh, and there we go. So if you know anyone who needs to understand this stuff a little bit more uh, efficiently, who needs to develop a better understanding of this, please direct them to this podcast. Let them know. I mean, most uh, almost everyone has iTunes. Let them know about the podcast. Share it with them. Make sure that you subscribe and your friends subscribe if they haven't already. And please leave a, a rating or a review. I'd love to hear your feedback. And again, we want to get this up on the top of iTunes as, 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 as best we possibly can to share this information with more and more people. So until the next episode... It's been great. Hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget to join me on the blog at supernutritionacademy.com forward slash blog. And hope you have a great day and I'll see you in the next episode.